Welcome to Happily Ever Aftermath, the podcast where we discuss relationships in movies and our relationships with them. I'm Plea Grinfield. And I'm Diana Rojek Sconner. Hello, Diana. Polina, hello. How are you doing? I'm fine. Good. Yes. Good. So today we are talking about Hannah and her sisters, which is Woody Allen's 1986 film. Correct. You know, I think like we've talked about, like we both tend to have lists of movies that we want to do for this podcast. And and I've had a couple Woody Allen movies on Mm -hmm. that list um, that I think I created you know, at some point kind of early on when we just kind of thought about this podcast, which you mean to tell me I could have rolled this into a theme month easily. Okay. Pun will come later, but yeah, we, I just didn't, I was, but, but I will tell you why I didn't ever suggest it as a theme month, which I'm actually surprised about, but I don't think you have to hold me back on wanting to put together a Woody Allen theme month. It's okay. Really? Well, well, I, I'm not a, do, I, do we need to get into this this early? <laughs> I would love to do a Woody Allen theme month. Well, um, I'm not sure I'm on board for that. Yeah, it's complicated, which is which is sort of why I want to talk about. I am not watching. Movie. It's complicated. Um, <laughs> uh, so I I started feeling like so after a while I started feeling like I kept like putting off choosing a, a Woody Allen movie for one reason or another. Was it just one reason or another? It was many reasons. And this, this, and so, but at one point recently, a couple things happened. One, I remembered what this podcast is about, um, <laughs> which was good because we've had a spate of guests and it's been nice because I haven't had to think about it. Um, I just have movies sort of dropped in my lap to watch, you know, a lot of Jude Law movies. It was fa- fabulous. But two things. One is that Emily Nussbaum, which um, I don't know if you have read a lot of her. She's a Pulitzer Prize winning critic who writes mostly about TV. Mm -hmm. And she recently came out with a book and of her uh, collected uh, of her essays um, and her her criticism, which has appeared in The New Yorker and New York magazine and I heard her on Fresh Air and she also wrote this essay um, for the book. We'll link this all in the show notes. But she was talking about basically contending with, I'm guessing, with her her love of Woody Allen. Part of it was her love of Woody Allen. But a lot of it was a lot. A lot of it was this sort of contending as a critic about sort of how, how do we put where do we put the work of basically like bad men in like the the kind of me too era and it's this amazing essay it's really 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 long um and unfortunately i can't find a link to it outside of her book maybe that'll change the little book just came out uh but we will link to the fresh air essay where she talks about it you say we as if it's not going to be me writing the show notes <laughs> that's true mm-hmm. i will send you the link though no oh, okay that's a good start um one of the things, so she talks a lot about sort of her love of Woody Allen, how she, it's kind of a rambling thing about like how she discovered Woody Allen and where his work sort of fit into her cultural history mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. and how she was kind of wrestling with it. And it's not really a, it's not a very prescriptive essay, I will say. She does sort of say that they're, the economic argument for forgetting about these artist is really strong. It's a really, really intense kind of exploration of her history and her feelings. And but one of the things she sort of talks about is like, what do we do with these things when they're when we love them and we've internalized them? Okay, it's one thing to not want to watch like she talks about she never really was into the Cosby show. Okay, And so it's easy for her to be like, okay, it doesn't matter. But she talks about like, how, how about things like Woody Allen, where it literally is so much of a part of it formed so many of your ideas okay so and so woody well, allen is mm-hmm. for me it's sort of feeling kind of disingenuous about like why am i if i if i have a podcast about like what movies influence my romantic I, my my ideas about romance mm-hmm. woody allen movies were huge in that i'm gonna have so many questions then i'm sure and so i just decided that i would just jump in and figure out how and explore that and thank you emma Nussbaum for giving me the, uh, I don't know about permission, but sort of the, a little bit of encouragement to well, do that. At the very least, she gave you a reminder. Yeah. That, and, that being said, mm-hmm. Hannah and her sisters. Yeah. So let me tell you about this movie. It's about Hannah and her sisters. Three successive Thanksgiving dinners mark time for Hannah, who's played by Mia Farrow. Her younger sisters, Lee, 
Barbara Hershey and Holly, Diane Wiest, which I know you're a big fan, who you, I know you're a big fan of, and the men in their lives. Lee is having an affair with Hannah's husband, Elliot, who is played by Michael Caine, and trying to end her Svengali like romance with artist Frederick Max von Sydow, who is hysterical in this movie. Really? I think she's so funny. He's so ridiculous. I see. Holly is frustrated by her lack of career fulfillment and her increasing dependence on Hannah's largesse while being courted by the hypochondriac Mickey, who is played by Woody Allen, who also wrote and directed this movie. It won a lot of awards. It's won um, Academy Award for Best Actress, Golden Globe for Best Motion Picture, Best Actor in a Supporting Role. That did, so that's Diane Wiest and then Michael Caine. Are you sure she didn't win for Supporting? She did. That's what I said. Oh, uh, we, Best Actress in a Supporting Role. You, well, you said Best Actress in the beginning, so. Oh, no. Mm-hmm. I, could have sworn I said best actress in a supporting role. Uh, best, um, I, I believe it won best writing as well. Yes, and okay. I was getting there. I think what's really important in all of this that you just described mm-hmm. is which impression of mine will win out first, Michael Caine or Woody Allen? Um, <laughs> I don't know. I'm doing neither. <laughs> oh, I'm but talk- I, I, I guarantee I, I would love, I would. I, no, no, I'm only speaking for myself. I cannot wait. Yeah. There's this line from The Simpsons, and I forget which Woody Allen movie that they were talking about, but Ned Flanders comes in with, I don't like these. They always have that nervous guy in them. <laughs> and the exactly. second he was on screen, I'm just like, oh, hey, yeah. Ned Flanders yeah. knew exactly what he was it's talking the nervous about. guy. I grew up watching Woody Allen movies. I actually, I was thinking, when did I first see this movie? The story, the, what I remember, I, when I looked up the actual facts of the case, didn't, do not jive at all. So. Wait, say that again. So I, when I thought I saw this movie. Okay. Uh, is not when I could have possibly seen this movie. Okay. You My, thought it was an age and it turns out. No, no. I think age was accurate. Age was accurate. Wait, okay. Uh, One of our big Christmas traditions, especially when I was a teenager Mm -hmm. and also a little bit when I was a kid, I have a very small family. So after we did Christmas or after we opened presents, we would either watch movies, Mm -hmm. like we rented a VCR when we didn't own one. That's how old I am. Uh, You still did that? Also, I, or we went, or Woody Allen movies would come out on Christmas Day and we would go watch them mm-hmm. um, and we'd go have Chinese food or something. Okay. So anytime a Woody Allen movie came out, we went to see it. I went to see it with my parents. And I was 13 when this movie came out. Okay. But it actually came out in, it had a wide theatrical release. Um, and at the time I was living in the New York tri-state area. So I would have probably, like it may have hit our theater in the first release, which would have been February, but the wider theatrical release was March. Mm -hmm. So that memory is obviously inaccurate, but I did, there was a lot of Woody Allen, like that was kind of an exciting thing for us. We would go watch a Woody Allen movie. So I was debating, I think I was going back and forth and this one just kept coming up and I realized it was probably because it was the first really kind of a adult Woody Allen movie that I really got that was about like just about relationships and not like kind of like uh, Z-Lig or which is you know, which is our Zelig. I don't actually know how to pronounce them. Um, Please define for the listeners who are me. The movie? No, Zelig or Zelig. What the movie? Just... The Zelig? Oh, that's a movie? Yeah. I thought you were using it as an adjective. No. Um, no. It's a movie where he appears in like every... I have... I Okay. So I know Bananas. Mm-hmm. I know Annie Hall. <laughs> yeah. I've never heard of, of this movie you spoke of. Oh, it's great. Okay. You should... Uh... I'm not. What? Um, um, you, if you're telling me I should go see it, I'm just going to tell you. No, nah, I'm not no, going to see it. No, not going to go see it. Well, no, because yeah. uh, my Woody Allen. Uh, yeah, what's your Woody Allen? My Woody Allen experience. I saw Annie Hall probably like in college. Mm-hmm. I'm like, hey, there's a lot of people in this movie that are very famous now. And that was it. Mm. I didn't really get it. I didn't understand the, the hype around it. Mm-hmm. I did appreciate the scene where. He's basically, you know, quote unquote, in, in as they say on the Internet, owns the guy when he's standing in line and the guy's talking all about how he knows and he's an expert on this subject. And he actually pulls out the author and says, yeah, because I got him right here. And uh, in, OK, no, <laughs> no, I do remember that. Yeah, scene. of course. It's, it's, it's very famous. It's a great one. Was um, it Marshall McLuhan? I think it might have been. I, I don't remember. I haven't seen any Hall in years. Well, yeah. I just... Um, 
Hey, but hey, it stuck with you. Well, well, because it's been parodied and yeah, that's true. It <laughs> kind of gets like who doesn't want to do that? I mean, come on, there are articles oh, that yeah. says you know on Twitter somebody says like you know nothing about this, and they're like, dude, that's J.K. Rowling. She created the entire Harry Potter universe. <laughs> Why would you say that she doesn't know? what a dementor is or something like that. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. That kind of thing. There's actually a really great book. Uh, Rebecca, uh, it's actually it's, the essay is fantastic, which is men explain things to me. The story that she tells is basically she's at a party and she's just written about some obscure writer or sorry, historian. I forget exactly the habit, but it was really obscure. And this man proceeds to tell her about a book that was written on, on the subject that was, that was very good. And, and she goes, Oh, I actually wrote a book about that. Mm -hmm. And he just started going on, kept going on like, oh, no, no, it couldn't. It, it's not that. And she was like, oh, this is fascinating. Like I wrote a book about somebody that was so obscure. People kept commenting about how obscure it was. So the fact that there's someone else writing an entire book of scholarship on this guy is like, re like at the same time is pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. And he just wouldn't. He, he just kept talking about this book every time she couldn't. She couldn't get him to, to hear the fact that she was the actual author, oh, which he kept denying. It's oh, fantastic. so she was the author then. She was always the author. Because, uh, anyway, it's a great it's a great essay. Do, wait, do we have to link to that now? Yes. Oh, um, write it down. Um, well, let's get to the actual let's get to the why actual you decided book. this movie. And you said that Woody Allen movies had a great impact on you. So mm -hmm. I'd like to hear more about that. Yeah. I mean, as I said, like I've watched... I watch Woody Allen movies. I even read a book by him whose uh, title escapes me now, but I'll, I'll think of it later. I even like, I think I even had like some of his, like a comedy album of his or something. Mm -hmm. um, I was a weird kid and spent a lot of time in uh, a used uh, record and bookstores. Okay. So, um, so back up but, one step. But, as, as and then I really li literally saw probably a, a movie of his every single year from the time I was like, mm -hmm eight and till probably 20, like until probably about eight years ago. Okay. Wait, what was that like? Blue Jasmine or something? A Blue Jasmine. Blue Jasmine may have actually been, which a movie I love may have been the last Woody Allen movie I've, I've seen that was in okay. theatrical release. I mean, like I can name them pretty well, mm -hmm. but I mean, yeah. So a lot of it, yeah. Like he just, I saw so many of these movies and I saw them actually like repeatedly. Like I probably saw this movie, I don't know, six times. In the theater? No, I saw it once in the theater and then probably, probably actually saw it another time in a second run theater. Okay. And this is uh, my dad. And then it hit you at this pivotal moment or? Yeah, I was, well, I was 13. It's okay. probably the, so I we went, we went with my parents. Mm -hmm. I do remember seeing it with my parents. Okay. I was 13, almost 14. And so I... I think this was like the first movie that I saw. I remember sitting with my parents. I was like, oh, I kind of get what they're doing, what they're talking about. Maybe not completely and not everything. And again, I see, so I've seen this movie over, you know, I, I wasn't like I saw all of it over and over again when I was 13 and 14. I saw it again over many years. Mm -hmm. There's something about how kind of ridiculous it felt very familiar to me and rewatching it felt very familiar. Like the minute the like credits rolled with that font that you see, you know, you see in almost every Woody Allen movie mm -hmm. with the mute, with the bebop that you hear in every single Woody Allen movie in the beginning, it just like felt very comforting to me. Okay. And which was weird because I wasn't not excited to watch it in a weird way. Like I was sort of dreading it like for the rewatch for the rewatch. Okay. Like this time. Okay. I think a lot of it was, I, I remember, you know, the, and, you know, I, a lot of these movies to me were sort of how I wanted to, like what I was trying to figure out how I was going to achieve the kind of life I imagined. So you wanted like, did, was there any one particular character's life or you know, the family as a whole? Step one, did you want sisters? I did want sisters. So okay. I think this movie is fascinating to me for a variety of reasons. Okay. One. You saw the dysfunction though, right? Yes, I did. Okay. But, you know, I was also 13. Like, you know, when I'm looking at it now through like adult lens, but to me it was like seeing those kind of circular, ridiculous arguments that occur in like this movie in particular, but a lot of Woody Allen movies mm -hmm. also like to me was it just if they felt very real and very familiar that you would have these sort of ridiculous arguments that kind of went nowhere, that people would try to like 
try to resolve something, you know, that, that just jived a lot with the adults in my life. And also the kids and like the, you know, relationships I had with human beings. There's a lot of, um, I was also trying to figure out what made women attractive and what was it that, how do I become, you know, attractive and interesting? And then there was just, there's just this life of like, you know, they all have kind of interesting creative jobs and histories and they live in lovely, like, West Side apartments, mm-hmm. um, talk about talk about things that I was becoming interested in, like music and poetry and art. Can you fill in a blank for me? Yeah. Okay. So you've got Hannah, who I suppose did a play, but then she's back to raising her kids. Well, she was a successful actress. She was a successful actress. But then she keeps like, you know, throughout the movie, she keeps like being, they keep talking about how she was a successful actress. I I didn't pick that up. Yeah. Because they say when she talks about the seagull, I agree with you. Like, I think on second watching as an adult, some of these things fall apart. But, but at dinner, like the, the first, so it occurs over three Thanksgivings. OK. And at the first, I'm telling you what I saw as a 13 year old. No, no, no. Not I that know. that's like an accurate, you know. But I was, tr- I was trying. Well, I was trying to piece it together because it's also very possible I missed something. Yeah. So, yeah, they so, talk about how she was like. Like her mother talks about, I mean, they all sort of talk about how she was successful. They keep kind of mentioning it. I was actually processing that as the mother gushing as she was the favorite. And Mm -hmm. that it wasn't necessarily a big successful thing. I interpreted that as, oh, you know, Hannah, you know, with her successful movie career. And I'm thinking, well, did she just do one play or something? Or is this actual? No, no. I mean, and uh, no, it gets mentioned like quite a few times. They're all kind of jealous uh, like the sis- other sisters talk about it I, like she and then and then she keeps like every thanksgiving she's like no i decided to try, like stop having a theater career mm-hmm. so that i could you know raise the children that's where i wanted to be and then i just thought i would just try this again and then i would get it out of my system and then the next one she's in another play and then the next one she's in another play see that's why i kept conflating it in my head because when you have these family dynamics of she's the successful one again mm. it's always said through the lens of mom is the one who's inflating her so therefore it's very easy to be jealous and it could have just been a single thing that's yeah. why i was having an issue with it Oh, okay. Yeah. I, that's not, that's not how I interpreted it. Um, So, so there was that version of it. And then mm -hmm. there was also Lee played by Barbara Hershey. Uh, She went back to school, but what did she do before? I don't know, but it's just like, she gets to live this life of like running around and being a a model kind of get her artist boyfriend, like to a 13 year old mind, these Mm -hmm. things, you know, it's, you're just sort of like, I was like, I'm going to live in New York and live a quote unquote creative life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was just trying to like piece together what that would look like okay. and what I would have to do mm-hmm. in order to have that. Yeah. And to me, the one that rang the most true was Diane Weiss' character. That's exactly Holly. Right. Yes. Who, where she's just, I'm sorry, I need to borrow money. I'm sorry, I need to mm-hmm. borrow money. And I'm just like, oh. Well, yeah. And actually, I really like, that's probably the story that I remember the most mm-hmm. because she's, she, like, there's a real genuine thing where she's sort of trying to find herself under her sister's shadow too like she's also an actress she's trying she keeps trying things and I was like and I sort of you know in my now I see it as what it was but my 13 year old mind I think I was like I really like that character really spoke to me Mm -hmm. um, because I was like oh I also am really struggling to try to figure out what I want to do and I'm kind of you know clumsy and messy and she just like I was like, that is going to be me. And she does actually become a successful writer in the end. Were you doing that much cocaine at 13? Okay, not the cocaine okay, part, okay. but that, <laughs> that was just part of it. <laughs> okay, good. I guess I was just trying to figure out how to make it work. And it's in a weird way also, I think when you're 13, like I was just having these, I just this whole idea of having crushes on people and it was so overwhelming, mm-hmm. you know, it would sort of take over your brain. Mm-hmm. And so kind of watching a adults try to navigate that was sort of comforting. And also there was, I mean, not comforting, but just like, oh, it's, I'm not crazy. Like, and also just this, yeah, it was like a certain way of, it was also, it's that moment where you like, also, as I said, it's the first sort of adult Mm -hmm. Woody Allen movie of a succession that I saw with my parent. I was like, oh yeah, I'm now entering into their world a little bit Mm -hmm. because I know who those poets are. I know what that music is. I know the references that they're talking about. And so I can speak to them about the things they care about. This is the stuff that 
my parents and their friends talk about Mm -hmm. and was expected to kind of know. I mean, but of course, this is me thinking of me earlier. When I watch it now, there's a whole like slew of emotions of like having a really hard time just watching Woody Allen on stage, but then laughing so hard. Mm -hmm. Um, Like his whole character, his this whole his whole like sort of neurotic character is so ridiculous Mm -hmm. and so funny. And there's so many great lines, but then also really being weirded out by it. And then also watching and realizing like how much my idea of what being, you know, kind of an in, a, an interesting woman came from a man who really didn't seem to see the, you know, women in his life as real. And, and yet they're, well, just like, I mean, I don't want to go into, you know, all of the sort of accusations against him, but I just feel like, you know, when he talks about, like, there's been a couple interviews where he was talking about, you know, oh yeah, Mia's fine. I don't really talk to her when like, clearly he's this like huge disruptive force in her life and just not acknowledging that I think is really strange. Is this now? Yeah. Like a, a few years ago. I see. It's just, it's sort of difficult to watch, but then it's also like, it's sort of like realizing that a lot of these movies and, you know, Emily Nussbaum talks about this too, is sort of, you were trying to figure out what men wanted to see from women, right? I mean, that's a lot of the movie, like at least for me, a lot of these movies that I was watching when I was younger Mm. had so much to do with trying to sort of piece together what it was going to look like to be the kind of adult I wanted to be. Were there other ones or in particular, so you, you identified with Holly the most, Diane Weiss's character. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm not a really good caretaker. I didn't really want to have children. So I don't, I, and I guess the point is that I don't think that all of that trying to learn from these movies was great. Like, I don't feel like some of the things I learned about, about how to, I don't think all of those things were really uh, useful. I, like, I feel like they're, you know, some of them are corrosive, but some of them are are interesting. The relationships, you mean? No, yeah, I just mean learning from these movies. Oh. You know, like sort of learning how to be an adult from Woody Allen movies may not really be the best idea. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure that a lot of people are using it as an instruction manual. No. Oh, no, but I'm just saying this is, of course not, and they shouldn't. But you know, my experience of this movies, of these movies, of a lot of these movies are. I mean, one, I I still feel like there's a lot of like I feel like the way he has conversation. So a lot of these f- kind of arguments that he has with people like ring really true to me. Yeah, that or rather that are in these are in these in this movie in particular, and the kind of conflicting feelings about, you know, wanting to be independent and yet close, you know, a lot, the, a lot of the stuff about, a lot of the stuff about sort of that weird thing about getting sick and, or or rather having tests and being weirdly not as relieved that when they come back negative, like obviously blown into comic proportions, but, you know, watching it now as an adult, like there's a lot, it was just, it just was complicated. Yeah. Well, complicated. And also I think the, the style of humor just kind of went over my head. I understood Mm. what they were going for. Yeah. What was your experience with it? Oh, wow. So I flash back to the first time I saw this approximately 23 hours ago. Mm -hmm. And, um, I'll say that uh, you know, similarly to lots of the other movies that I watch, I just, you know, I have my guard up for these types of things. I mean, I have a generic idea of Woody Allen movies. Like I said, I saw Annie Hall. I didn't understand the full hype of it. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if it was one of those situations where if I watched it, you know, at one age and then I watched it again, I could see what everyone saw or mm-hmm. what everyone liked about it. But I don't have the time to rewatch a movie. Mm-hmm. To that yeah, effect. I mean, it's like if it wasn't your thing, then why would it be? And and also, I, I suppose I just don't like the character. There's mm-hmm. something about neuroses that just kind of turns me off. Mm. And in, and not like neuroses, like people have. Never mind. No, no. But this this idea of the neurotic sort of New Yorker mm-hmm. who's just like worried all the time and is self-involved. No, I have enough exa- anxiety in my yeah. life. I don't think I need to see it played for laughs. Yeah. Um, and in addition to that, I mean, uh, a lot of these characters, I just, I, I was just like, 
confused by most of them. Like, mm. I mean, am I supposed to, are we supposed to hate Michael Caine's character? Are we supposed to like Michael Caine's character? Are we supposed to watch him and just watch the things implode in front of him? Is there I sympathy? think we're supposed to do both. We're supposed to. Oh, because I, I didn't. I did none of it. Um, I mean, I, I. Well, I guess it's funny because when I was watching it the first time I watched it, mm-hmm. I really had a really hard time, like not imagining you watch it. Like I was almost like you were in my head and I couldn't, I was kind of watching it with like, how was your my lens? It was amazing. Cause okay. it's always amazing. Your hair is always amazing. Thank I you. mean, Apollo, was- Apollo was next to you. It was, I mean, it was no. on your lap. He didn't even stick around for the movie. Well, see, this is the imaginary me, you in my head while I'm watching this movie. I so I guess like to me, I think, I think that style of humor is a big part of like of what I considered funny, you know, or or what I was brought up to like liking Woody Allen movies was sort of a given. It was like, Mm -hmm. this is what we like as a family. It's like, you know, when you said one time you said to me, like Cal Rose Rice, you're like, yeah, whenever anyone says rice. It's Calrose Rice. All other I rices. Said that, I said that are, to you in confidence, Polina. I'm sorry. I can cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> and all other like rice ha- needs to have like a description behind it, like jasmine or what or whatever. That's how I feel about like finding Woody. That's how I grew up finding Woody Allen movies funny. It's just a given. It's like this was this was the humor. That was humor. That was humor. Oh wow. And I still find it hysterical. I still found it very funny. Okay. Despite myself. I think the second time I watched it, I sort of relaxed a bit and really, I enjoyed it a little more. And I decided that you were not here watching it with me and that I had to have my own experience. But it was funny because you're my idea. And I was kind of arguing myself, like, you don't know what, what Diana's going to feel. Like, you just don't. But it's funny that actually I was pretty dead on. It um, sounds like you were channeling the neuroses of the character. <laughs> I was a little bit, which yeah. is, you know, a comforting thing. Well, humor is difficult and it's subjective. So, mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of the times, I mean, a lot of the movies, I mean, we, we talk about this all the time where you say like, I'm sorry, I made you watch this. I'm like, I have made you watch things as well. Mm-hmm. So it, it, you know, it's a give and take type of thing. Yeah. And if we're, if we're watching it, it's just, it's just there. But, but for me, it was just like, uh, uh I'm just not sure what to anticipate, except I know the very basic premise of Michael Caine's character is going to be having an affair with, you know, his wife's sister. So I knew that much about the movie. I had no idea where it was going to go. I actually didn't even process that Woody Allen was in this movie until he actually appeared Mm -hmm. because I'm just like, oh, yeah, because you got the sisters and you got Michael Caine. Yeah, you don't really think about it. And he's like such a a random. And he's he's a big part of the movie as well. Yeah. And I actually think that he kind of overshadows the sisters. Even though he's probably just like maybe in one quarter of the movie at best. I feel like when he appears, it almost becomes like a weirdly different movie. And mm-hmm. it only made sense for me until rewatching it. Like that was my experience, which I do not remember being my experience. I, mm-hmm. There's all these scenes of him kind of rushing around and having this incredibly neurotic mm-hmm. Uh, kind of breakdown. He basically has this like breakdown during this movie where basically he's this hypochondriac who runs like a Saturday Night Live type show. Esque. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, and uh, he... I, I, I am going to speak of the awkwardness of the beginning and his introduction and the Saturday Night Live thing where they're screaming about time because they had to chi- cut out the <gasps> child molester Okay, sketch. that was like, I was watching it with Sean, who was literally, I was like, he was like, he was like, well, that didn't take long. Yeah, that was a little like, there were these moments which, you know, of course I would have not have noticed, but mm-hmm. now feel very like, whoa. And there's a couple of those in the movie which take you out, which is why it was a little easier for me the second time where I could just like enjoy the dialogue and then enjoy, like Michael Caine is, it's so painful how awkward and in love he is. You know, he's just such a buffoon. And so that's where I think you're supposed to find it. It's kind of like we're, I guess like the part that you're supposed to find funny is how maybe it's rooted in how ludicrous we all are, how we think we're like these sophisticated people. And we then we we get put into some situation and our plans and our logic just sort of collapse and we become kind of, you know, idiots. Well, also understand that I am not used to romantic Michael Caine. I'm used to uh, fatherly butler Michael Caine. 
Mm. So, see, I'm used to like, yeah, I, a lot of Michael Caine for me is Woody Allen movies, but a lot of Michael Caine for me is like, yeah, there's. So I guess yeah, there's a definitely like a there's definitely a generational thing going on, I would and think I'm so. be, like and, being and, used to it, and and the and the gap is like magnified times twenty as we talk about this movie. Yeah. Of our generational gap yeah. here. And all right. Well, so yeah. then since uh, we're talking about all of this here, the, the actual relationships themselves, I mean, mm-hmm. for the premise of our podcast, mm-hmm. what particular relationship would you actually want to look at through the lens of what we typically look at? I think the one that has sort of the uh, probably I would say uh, we have uh, Woody Allen's character, Mickey and Holly, the Diane Weist character. Yeah, because that was an actual origin. Yeah, like it had an place. arc. It had a really interesting arc. Or you could, you know, um, we could talk about Barbara Hershey's Lee and nameless guy that she eventually uh ended up bringing to the last Thanksgiving yeah, yeah. that she married and that she was married to I mean she talks about him doing I can't even remember now I'm like spacing on his, it was his her, job it was her what, it was her professor because she professor. keeps going from one professor to another that way I was not into however Barbara Hershey in this movie it's like she's really she's stunning first off how how much older is Max von Sydow's character I would to be? assume like a lot well, oh, a lot like, like 30, 20, 20. I'm going to okay. guess like at least 20. OK. OK. Yeah. She keeps like at least this professor seems closer to her age. Still her professor, though. Still her professor. But, you know, I don't know. He seems maybe her age. So but she clearly like that's kind of another thing that I realize is kind of like deadly. The sort of idea like every single person, like all the men are constantly trying to like impart art onto the women, mm. you know, like you have to read this. Yeah, you, you have, have to, to listen to this. this. This is it. To me, that seemed that's like one of those things that seemed very, very normal. Like I was like, oh, that's what men do like because that's what guys in my life were doing and did for years and it seemed totally normal the fact that I wasn't going to be that person for somebody never into that I could be that person for somebody even though I was obviously I mean we all are you like tell people about things and aren't you, tell them why they love them aren't you doing this into the microphone right now yeah kind of yeah okay. but it's like it, except, that is sort of damaging ex- like ex- these ideas are kind of damaging except your power now Polina thank you all right um, yeah, that was a little weird. Well, so, if we're looking yeah. at Mickey and Holly, um, I don't know if there's any time on screen that we could potentially even claim that's when they, cause, cause they go from reuniting after, so they had a horrific date and then they reunite and they talk to each other and then she gives him her screenplay. Well, she reads it aloud to him. She reads it out loud to him and then... Um, then it's Thanksgiving again. Well, no, they go on a couple more dates. Did they? They went at least one. On screen? Mm-hmm. I don't remember. They went it. for that walk there at the Central Park when they had to talk to each other about, uh, they, had to, they basically apologized for the people that they were like several years ago. I thought that happened after the reading. No, no, it happened separately. Okay, I because clearly she, I didn't have a lot to work with. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's true. I mean, it's sort of like the arc. I mean, you could also say uh, we could talk about Lee, uh, Lee and Michael uh, Elliot. I mean, there's a lot of history there that we never saw. Well, like, do you think that it, like, do you think that Lee ever f- uh, fell in love? I mean, there is sort of several moments at which she. I don't think so. You don't think so? I I don't. I, I'm not. I'm not attached to these characters, mm-hmm. and I don't see any type of depth in them mm. that I think that was intended. Or maybe I'm missing the point because it's a comedy. Mm-hmm. What, what? Why don't you speak on behalf? Um. Well, I think I I think a lot of it is the poem. Like I think when like I think that um, Lee seems kind of like. The sort of idea of, you know, keeping keep being attracted to these kind of these Svengali characters. And you were saying like um, uh, that Max von Sydow is hysterical because every time like he just he just come like she comes home and, like kind of late and he's like he just starts going on this diatribe like uh, about um, 
uh, about, you know, about he's like, oh, you missed a fantastic movie about the Holocaust. Like it, mm -hmm. he just he's sort of like just so outsized that character that it's just fun to watch. I just thought he was hysterical. I just thought their whole day was just so ludicrous and hysterical. Oh, OK. Um, and, you know, but then it's like. You know, there's something like it's a sort of an air of menace with this sort of Svengali sort of thing that you it's really, really hard to it's hard to take out what you know of Woody Allen, especially since a lot of it was filmed in their apartment. In Mia Farrow's apartment. In, in, yeah. Mm -hmm. In Mia Farrow's apartment. Yeah. I read that in the trivia. It's, yeah. It's really weird. Mm -hmm. um, anyway. Um, so I think that like just that poem, like when she reads that E. Cummings poem mm -hmm. and I think like. Uh, yeah, that's like, I, I think that it's this moment of like, oh my God, somebody feels this way about me. It's mm -hmm. almost like, oh, now this person feels this way about me and puts me on a pedestal and sort of yeah. like distances himself from me. Like that's somehow, that's clearly kind of her jam. Well, I was about to say, I, I don't know if it's something that's even more powerful because she clearly has this relationship where this other person is dependent on her. He, you know, Max von Sydow's character tells her that she is his link to the outside world. And if he loses her, he has nothing. Yeah. So, yeah, you say that this is her jam. I'm, yeah, I believe you. That's why I'm not yeah. really sure about the extent of her, you know. Being in love, yeah. With, with Michael Caine's character. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's true that you don't really see that. I mean, I think that's also the easiest one to maybe talk about, um, to talk about what happens to them next. Uh as someone who is invested in this story, I, uh, I, I yield the floor to you as, uh, as the first answer. Um, I don't think they, which they, well, I think that we should do, I think the, the, the two that make the most sense, cause we know nothing about Lee and her new oh, husband, her husband, yeah. including his name, mm -hmm. um, which we can't remember. Um, I'm gonna call him Ivan. Let's call him Ivan. That sounds great. Um, so we've got Mia, we got, uh, uh, Mia Farrow and Michael Caine there. We could talk about them. Um, Go ahead. so we have Hannah and Elliot. Um, but I don't know if like, I mean, I feel like, uh, I don't know. I, I think they're just. I think they're going to keep running into this, but I think it works for them. I mean, do you do you think that they will stay married? I do. Okay. Okay. I do. Based off of the fact that they've seen their conflict, but they'll just maintain it? I think they've seen their conflict and he's realized what uh what he wants from a relationship and then the and she realizes that uh and i think for her it's a comfortable it works like i think they genuinely do care about each other i think like um I, my only worry is if it comes out that he basically had a year-long affair with her friggin sister mm -hmm. i can't see especially yeah, since, like where are you at with that? well especially since that holly's first script involved um deep personal secrets that she even admitted that she found out from Lee and it was only things that Elliot would have known about. It was that far into it because Hannah doesn't talk about it with anybody except for her husband. So the fact that it found out in the script, I'm a little disappointed in the fact that she could not put the dots together. Yeah. But I feel like it's almost like it was like a willful, like oh. not wanting to put the dots together. Like, like in some ways it's sort of like that, like, I think what's interesting is, is about the sisters is a lot of these movies are sort of about your perception of how other people perceive you. Like a lot of this movie, especially with the sisters, they sort of have all these conversations where they, they mirror back like what their idea of each other is. Okay. So like, uh, well, with all of, we, you know, with all of Holly just kind of complaining, I, I. I didn't really buy anyone's perception of anybody. Mm. Um, okay. Uh, I, yeah, I bet it's, but like Holly, uh, 
I like at some point Mia Farrow talks about the fact that she's like uh is sort of shocked that people think that she doesn't need anything. Okay. Right? And yet she kind of loves this, but yet like every time Holly talks to her, she uh you know, she's always like she's like like she she asks her for money like three or four times in the movie, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And at some point she always says, she like uh Holly always says, you know, you're going to be mad at me. And she literally never is like Hannah for reasons that don't make any sense to me. She's like, she's like, sees this as her role. She, she was, though, when she read the script. Only when she read the script mm-hmm. was she angry. But she was never whenever Holly asked Hannah for money. Mm-hmm. Holly always preceded it with. You're going to get frustrated with me. You think I'm a loser. You think all these things. Mm-hmm. Um, and Holly never, and then, but Hannah never is upset. That we see. Yes, but that's all we have. Okay. Right? I mean, but she's never upset with her. Like, you never see her actually mentioning the fact that she lent her money. Mm. Uh, okay. Okay. So, anyway. Um, so... So anyway, so, uh, okay. But I think if we're going to talk about Mickey and Holly, Holly. Uh where do we get, like, what do you think happens? I mean, I could, I have so many questions about how at the end there's supposed to be this surprise that Holly is pregnant and her and Mickey have been married and they seem to be very, very happy. But, you know, part of the conflict of that is, uh, one of the reasons that Mickey and Hannah broke up is because he can't conceive children. And so she ends up speaking to his former business partner, ends up having twins um, with his former business partner, which, by the way, that. that oh, com- my God. That scene was so uncomfortable. The scene where they're asking about it and the wife is there. I'm like, I am 100 percent on the wife's side. Oh, just yeah. Like, we are not having this conversation oh, yeah, right totally. now. We are going to go home and have this conversation. It's yeah. like. I suppose I could do. That. I mean, oh, I, I know I that was, blood, right? <laughs> was so ridiculous. And I'm just like, no talking. I give blood. Read, I give blood. I give to the poor. I eyes. give clothes to the poor. <laughs> like not. Geez. That was so awesome. Never has there been more of me wanting to scream something. If like Ryan and I, we can communicate with with not even an eyebrow raise. Oh yeah, no, no, no married couple. Like yeah, that was the most ludicrous. Like it just make again. I, I just wanted to punch people. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that's the, you know it's supposed to be for humor, but I'm just too busy being angry. At yeah, no, I get it. I mean, that Listen makes sense. to her. Yeah, she's even saying it out loud. She's literally saying it out loud, and he's sort of in his own world. Like, um, and then you see it coming, and you're like, and they're sitting there, like laying out dessert. You know, it's like it's so it's so weirdly awkward. Uh, there was just you know, yeah. it's just. Strange. But I mean, you know, I guess that to me is the humor of just like the ludicrousness of that situation and how like again, I'm so you would handle like how people handle things. I is loose. I have so much anxiety in social situations. I yeah, don't, I, I, I don't want to. Uh, <sighs> anyway, um, I'm sorry I traumatized you by this movie. Pretty sure that you didn't traumatize me. Okay, good. Yeah. Um. Uh, no, well, what I was getting at was how is it like he's finally relaxed? So therefore his swimmers work like how they, that's sp- my, I'm, that was kind of, that's where I went. Okay. I don't, because I, like, you know, remember he had this huge sort of awakening where he, yeah, right. He's kind of, he had a kind of a break. He had a nervous breakdown. Mm-hmm. Like, and then he I mean, sort of started realizing like, like, I can't live like this. Like, I have to take I have to take some pleasure in things. Right. And so in turn, I guess it, it because it's like not quite my sense of humor. I think that I was going to try to go for it and matching it, but it's going to fall flat on his face. Mm. This is the part where he's finally enjoying life. And then that's when he's going to get hit by a truck. <laughs> because that's your future he's well, gonna that's his future track. because yeah. of, of course this guy who was so neurotic about everything hypochondriac when it comes to everything getting tested of course it's gonna, not going to be a disease you know it's not going to be symptoms it's going to be something where all the things that he was always terrified about 
that's, that's what's going to happen. Yeah. While he's enjoying well, life. Well, that's exactly, then you got the humor. Mm. <laughs> oh, okay. I, mean, um, I don't feel, I, mean, I don't feel good about it. I feel like an asshole. But. Oh, no, I think it's, uh-huh. I, I get it. Which is also kind of weird, though, because again, Holly's script talking about how, you know, this woman is just attacked and it's basically a nod to the fact that this other relationship that she was trying to pursue with Sam Waterston, but in turn, he ended up uh, preferring her friend, Carrie Fisher. Mm-hmm. And, and so she's just writing about that. And you hear a nod to that in her script about how I guess she's going to get attacked. No, yeah, I'm, yeah. I mean, no, no, these like, people are not. Yeah, I get it. You're angry. Yeah, but I just. Don't but it's like it's not like they dated for you know a mm. year and then. Well, she was just perpetually jealous and insecure. Yeah, exactly. Also, but then like somehow like, yeah, and I guess I guess you're I my my idea and it definitely like gets my idea of it was especially when I was younger was that she basically finds her way right she finds the thing that she is good at Holly yeah yeah anyway I cut you off Uh, well yeah well also it's not even that I mean I wouldn't even say that that was a great script granted I didn't hear most of it all I heard was the end Mm -hmm. um she she found somebody who was also able to lift her up so yeah that's helpful at least I'm, I'm sorry I killed your husband (laughs) <laughs> but not that sorry i'm not that sorry i don't think you're sorry i'm not and you don't have to be sorry mm. um i don't think they make it either um i think that like does he live i think he lives in my case he lives um just because i haven't i haven't killed off anyone yet oh that's not true i think i killed off somebody um i uh i just can't remember who i um i just think that they sort like i think that they date for a couple of years, but it sort of feels like this whole cohort. You mean, you mean get married? I'm sorry. You're right. They were married. No, they were married. They were married. Um, I think they have a kid. I think the kid is like six. I think that um, I basically, I actually, I'm going to go because I love Diane Weist. I'm going to go that she, um, she becomes a really successful writer. Okay. I mean, he's lifted her up and she's, uh, I mean, she's definitely got enough fodder with her family to write a lot of scripts um, just based on that. Um, And but I think, you know, I think they're both uh, pretty self-involved. So I don't know. I think that she's going to find some I think I think at some point she's going to fall in love with an or uh, have an affair with an actor uh, on the set of one of her Mm-hmm. plays okay i mean one of her movies um i think uh i think she's uh and i think she's gonna you know she's gonna uh that'll be somewhere inside like she'll go to la to have a movie made um she'll kind of fall in love and she'll realize like she'll realize that this is kind of where she wants to be and she kind of wants to be away from her crazy family. I think it'll happen after the parents die. Mm -hmm. Like I think a lot of the, um, I think a lot of that family dynamic is really going to shift when that happens. I can see that. So, uh, yeah, I think she like, and I think that, uh, Mickey will stay in New York, um, and, you know, continue to, date women some of which probably are younger than him but I think he'll like I mean I think he had a real revelation and I'm kind of hoping it stays a little bit I realized that even though I very quickly killed off Mickey I didn't give a future to Holly no what's your future to Holly well what's frustrating is that I was looking up the awards and everything and I love Diane Weist as we all know I have my Weist Mode Mm t-shirt and What's very frustrating is that she has three Academy Award nominations and she's won two Academy Awards, both of them from Woody Allen movies. And I have not liked either character now having finally seen Hannah and her sisters. Mm -hmm. I mean, whether or not the person is likable is irrelevant, you know, because it's about whatever. But um, didn't like her character in this movie very much. Didn't like her character in Bolts Over Broadway, which she won her other Academy Award for. Mm -hmm. Her nomination was for Parenthood. And I adore her character mm. from Parenthood. So in order for me to kind of rectify what I considered this be this slight injustice in my brain, mm. uh, what's going to happen is that she's going to have her kid and she's going to name him Gary. 
And, uh, <laughs> oh my God. And she's going. You're basically to, tying this Woody Allen. Don't sully parenthood with this. <laughs> no, not sully parenthood. I'm saying that eventually she will find happiness in the teacher of, in the future teacher of her son's, you know. Um, okay. Now I want to rewatch Parenthood. Parenthood is so good. Oh, I want to rewatch it. It's probably not as good as I remember it, but oh, that, that, I'm going to put that on my list because I, Parenthood was. Boy, so what are we doing like? We could have, we could have, uh, I'm trying to think of a good, I was actually on, no, on the Bard, I was trying to think of a good, uh, there's like, I could only think of Weast Winter, which was the worst pun. Okay. Leave the puns to me. I can't do puns. No, this is not her. Thing. Well, first of all, if, number one, make sure we have enough movies to fill it through. That's an entire season, my friend. Yes. That's the, pr- that was the problem with Weast Winter. Okay. That's why it's terrible and it didn't suggest it. Well, also, do we have another, what what movie would you, Parenthood? I could do Parenthood. No, no, I'm saying like, who's, who, who? I have to look at her filmography. I have a terrible memory. No, I I'm just, saying, who, who would we even examine in Parenthood? I don't know. Because they're all like. I just really like that movie. Well, no, I like it too. I'm just saying. Uh, <laughs> Keanu Reeves and Martha Plimpton. Yeah, no. exactly. No, I don't know. I mean, this, this didn't have that much to it. Also, there's an entire TV series. I that, mean. To be honest, I sort of wanted to do, I was like, I'm like, mm, there's like, there are sort of less Woody Allen-esque. And um, I mean, this is considered one of his best, but um, I was thinking of doing Annie Hall, but then I sort of, Annie Hall was like, it was a bit like varsity if I was going to revisit Woody Allen, because Annie Hall was one of those movies that a lot of guys that I, like my, my a lot, especially guys that I dated, um, and we're sort of like, you're like an Annie Hall type. Mm. And I just couldn't, that was like, like, so you wear pants. What, what does that mean? Well, yeah. I mean, but I was just like, you know, kind of goofy and enigma. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I've hats? seen it. No, I think it was the character being sort of like kind of flighty and spacey and yet like, really independent and just, I don't know I feel like it always said more about their idea of me uh but yes I do wear a lot of pants and I do dress in layers I'm going to use the fact and I do wear a lot I used to wear a lot of men's blazers okay and I do wear a lot of scarves so there was like I kind of get it but then every time I would re-see it I was like okay I had a uh, Sean was one of those people he I ha- totally thinks of like because I think a lot of men find that character extremely charming. Oh, I can't speak on behalf of men. No, I cannot either. Okay. I can only speak on behalf of myself. Well, what I'll say is that, you know, when you initially brought this up and said you think it's time to do Hannah and her sisters, of course I hesitated due to the, you know, Woody Allen-ness of this movie. <laughs> um, but you just said Spacey and I will give you the benefit. And this is what I kind of channeled when I was watching this. I was a huge Kevin Spacey fan for years. And a lot of people would say certain things. They'd be like, oh, blah, 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 Kevin Spacey. And, you know, you have a crush on him. I'm like, I never had a fucking crush on him. OK, people have talent crushes. Never in any instance was I like imagining myself marrying this man or mm-hmm. anything to that effect. So how dare all of you people? Um, also, in all the movies that he's in, thank God there wasn't really much of a love story involved. So, OK, so serial killer uh, lusting after his daughter's best friend. Um, what were the other movies in it? Oh yeah. Um, accused of killing Jude Law. See all these movies, Mm -hmm. not good for the podcast. So yay for that. But at the same time, I also understand what you were describing with that article. Um, you know, author or creator versus the art that they're creating. It's always just this ongoing debate, not to mention the impact that it has on us. So that's why I tried to approach this movie with an open mind despite mm-hmm. the fact that that neurotic thing in the glasses was right there. And I'm just mm. like, you're, you're still not funny. Well, it's funny. There are two quotes that kind of address that, that which I will read really, really closely. Um, uh, it, and it said uh, on that, which said, um, uh, it, there, there are a couple of quotes. So one is, it said, uh, she was asking herself, like, why, why so much of the work that she loved as uh, as a teenager and as a young woman, um, and which a lot of the obsessions that she had, I also shared. Like a lot of the writers, Philip Roth, John Updike, she mentions lots. Of, um, 
said maybe as a young woman, um, I'd opened my heart so wide to sexist art because it was among the most celebrated art. Or maybe as a heterosexual woman, it was because I felt like it would help me learn things about men. Hmm. And that really spoke to me. The other one, you know, when she talked about, it said it was, you know, she talks about why these things are hard. It was, and for me, it's easier for me, even though I've always loved Kevin Spacey so much, like, a, you know, really? it's sort of a so really, mark. Even after k Pax. I never saw K-Pax. You're smart. I mean, I'm selective, but... Um, I'm not. Okay, I I, I, uh, I I mean, when I love, like, a lot of it, I think, is like, there was a time when you would have an actor in a movie, and it would be a sign that it was a good movie. Like, it was quality. It was worth spending your money on. It was going to be an experience that you had. I didn't go to time. a lot of it, but it's been a while since that has been... Well, that's not entirely... But, um, and a lot of the stuff is left over from a time when like I, you know, going to the movies and figuring out what movie you were going to go to was much more of a habit mm. for me, much like I think a lot of like for me going to see Woody Allen movies was a habit, much like going to see Avengers movies is a habit for a lot of a, a people much things like, in the Avengers universe. Much like when the most recent Tarantino movie came out. Tarantino is, I think, the only director I still feel that way about, though I haven't, though I actually haven't seen the, his last two movies in the theater, so. Ryan definitely wanted to see Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and I resigned myself to seeing it. Another movie where I went in with my arms crossed, mm. and I'm just like, all right, do the thing, Tarantino, with the feed and the thing where you're backing up and you're in a car. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but that's, but like Ryan was like, I want to go see this Two in hours, 45 minutes. It's his, yeah. I mean, I feel that way about the Avengers, though. I just like, I mean, it's not two hours and 45 minutes, but just like. No, that was three hours, I one am, minute. I am really, really bored by superhero movies. Like, I go to see them very sporadically, probably like, you know, the kind of, like, sadly, I just, I do like movies where people just walk around New York City and talking. I think that's what made this, I'm like, I wish. Oh. Are one of these people a talking raccoon like character? No, not usually. Uh, but but I did enjoy I it when it can be. I, and I'm going to actually ask, but I am going to end on a note that uh, a, a, another kind of um, Nussbaum note, which is um, which is that I do want to mention the kind of you know which I wish we t- sort of talked about more. Um, and um, and actually, also, I'm surprised we didn't talk about like the kind of the kissing and sort of sort of sex scenes, I guess, if you could call it, though there isn't a lot of that in this movie. I think one of the reasons I also found them kind of comforting is like the sex is, it's kind of like the 13-year-old version of it in a weird way where it's, I wanted to have it. I don't remember sex scenes. I want, and they were like making out and it always looked very unattractive, the making out in Woody Allen movies. Like, I mean, like, sorry, in the Hannah and her sisters in particular, I haven't rewatched it, which um, I'm glad about, I guess, that there isn't a lot of that because I think it would be weird. But I read there was a sex scene that they cut. Yeah. I mean, you sort of see, you see them kissing and then you see them like, you sort of see uh, Elliot's, uh, Michael Caine's body sort of covering Barbara Hershey's face like it's or his head kind of covering her face. I don't know. But I realized it was like, oh, hey, I'm watching a lot of these with my parents at a sensitive age. And also, I feel like it's the same thing. I wanted to have sex when I was 13. I or I was interested in I had feelings like that, but I also found sex gross so I think maybe that's like, that was my kind of one observation was how kind of unsexy the kisses were. Mm. And that I was like, I, that was my thought. Um, so I just want to say that, um, they're weirdly, um, and, but I just want to say that, um, uh, another like thing, I just want to end on this note, which is, um, that she was talking about, her, uh, like, you know, we're talking about sort of coming to grips with these things that are a part of you. Like, you can't separate them from yourself because they're already there. You've already been shaped by Woody Allen movies. You're, uh, or not you, I, uh, one, me. Um, I would say it's there, but I'd say yeah. there's a large portion of you that's not even connected to it. Yes, sure. But that's not the portion I'm contending with. So, oh, oh, yes, I'm trying, yeah. I'm trying to, 
Um, I'm trying to say you don't have to contend with it that hard. I do. Go on. Go no, on. no, but I want to. I mean, oh, well, of he- course, I don't have to, but that's kind of the point of this podcast. So I'm just going to end. And so this note, which I kind of was part of the comforting is or part of this um essay I thought was was really good. It said that part of this contending is has meant simply imagining what it would have been like if women's work had been the default setting back when I was growing up. What if the model of male genius and most often white straight male genius was not the force that the rest of us needed to get around to go through to become who we are? Mm-hmm. And I think in rewatching this movie... And in contending with, you know, some of these um, in sort of realizing that um, at some point I am going to run into these movies and I'm, um, and maybe even I want to rewatch some of these movies um, that uh, I think she kind of uh, it's it's one way of contending. I thought that kind of one way of contending with it. OK. And made me think about when I was watching it. So. Okay. So yeah, nobody has to do this, but at some point, you know, with all of the other reckoning that you have, that one has had to do over the past few years and all of the, uh, all of the kind of the, the, the thinking about the stories that you've told yourself um, about what was okay and acceptable and how you were going to move through the world as a woman um, and how you were going to look at, you know, your experiences um, and how you wanted um, kind of the next generation of women, of women to, to be able to move through the world. Like, uh, you know, in another phase of that, I think, you know, for me has to be sort of, you know, thinking about the influences um, that sort of, you know, has made me who I am too. Mm. Right. Not just my actions. Anyway, Mm -hmm. that's what I think about. You got all serious. I mean, I mean, my instinct is always to, you know, crack a joke. I mean, you can, I mean, I, I (laughs) feel you Polina, because, you know, I remember a big portion of my life has just been deeply influenced by Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, The Secret of the Ooze. And, you know, when you go back to that, you may find something really troubling. You don't know. Yeah. I mean, why were they all male? I mean, well, that's what I mean. Yeah. I mean, like, that seems insane. I mean, how? Why? Actually, I actually haven't seen that movie very much. OK. I'm a liar. So it didn't actually. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, but like, I mean, even just like the John Hughes movies that we were watching, like, I mean, this is the thing, like a lot of this stuff is so in the air and it's been such a shock to rewatch like 16 Candles and be like, and I grew up on Revenge of the Nerds. So it's just its own thing. So, yeah. Anyway. Well, there it is. Um, So let's do our business. Well, I also want to give a small nod to Sam Watterson and Diane Weiss and the fact that they are law and order. Dung, dung. Yes. Yes. You know. We might have to do it, yeah. Yeah, Sam Waterston is uh, also kind of It was just interesting to see to them. Watch. Well, it was just interesting to see them on screen, and I'm just like, ha, ha, like, many, many, like a couple decades from now, you're going to be all like, you know, objection, your honor, together. <laughs> you have to, like, like, it's this thing where I'm like, it's an actor. They just do all these things. I can't, like, associate, I don't know, I just. I can't turn it off. I can't, yeah, I can't, I can't, like, associate them with a later, like, if I see an earlier movie, I'm just delighted to see the person. And then eventually, there's going to be another lawyer who's also going to be Batman's dad. <laughs> you good. And that Batman was also with Michael Caine in that movie. See, I'm amazing. You are amazing. All right. So, All right. So. There it is. We uh, kind of did a thing, maybe. <laughs> we did a thing. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. Well, then, um, Hannah and her sisters, Woody Allen movies. What do you feel about the neurotic guy? He's in all these movies. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, it's hard. It's harder to watch him. But I have to say the second time around, I was like, since I had to. I have to say, like, you know, I kind of did laugh despite myself. I kind of like the neurotic guy, though. I did find it got really grating, like, in later movies. I can't watch modern Woody Allen movies. But I don't actually, I, 
it's not a neutral experience watching him actually. No, well, so no, it's, I, got that. I don't know. No, no, no. I heard you. But what you didn't really seem to recognize is that I was kind of gearing, gearing us up. And I was asking our listeners with what I just said, if you have thoughts on that, you can tweet at us at Hemcast. H E A M C A S T. No, see, Plina, you just talked for an hour about that. So we know what you think. I want to know what they think. <laughs> yes. And you can- Actually, I was about to go into that was I was going to say it is not a it's not a simple thing. So I was really curious. How do other people contend with this? I'm if super, super curious, if at all. If at all. There you go. All right. So that's us on Twitter. We're also on Facebook at Happily Ever Aftermath. Um, if you have longer thoughts, you can always get at us at our uh, email, contact at hemecast.com. I have a question for you, please. Yes. Um, if I wanted to kind of relax a little bit after such a very deep episode that turns out you went deeper than I thought, but I was just like kind of so engrossed in it. I feel like I need to calm down. You know, I think I have the perfect uh, solution for you. Tell me. So I don't know if you've heard of this brand of aromatherapy products called Frankie and Myrrh. I'm familiar. Yeah, they're awesome. And I would recommend actually a blend called Hello Sunshine for you. Okay. You're going to kind of want to get into that happy place quickly. And aromatherapy can do that for you. Now, what I like about Hello Sunshine is it really does like totally... Put you, it puts me in at least a good mood. It's got citrus and it's got rose. Hmm. I find I have a very old car that I've been driving a lot and I find it's like quite deodorizing. Interesting. It really does like freshen the car really quickly and it puts me in a really good mood. And I know you like citrus. I And I think you like rose. I think I remember you saying you like like rosy things, but I can't quite remember. You don't know me. But I know you do like citrus. I do like citrus. Yeah. I do like citrus. And it's, yeah, it's just lovely. Well, I, I would think, do that. Well, I think but, it's a given that I'm sold on this, but okay. I think it's kind of important that I don't pay full price for this. Oh, of course not. No. Of course not. Because you're going to want multiple scents, when, you know. So I know how to solve that problem for you. Mm-hmm. Here's what you do. You go to Frankie and Murr. That's Frankie, F-R-A-N-K-I-E, and, A-N-D, of course. Mur, M Y R H. M Y R R H. R R H. That's very important. Always forget the second R in Mur. You select whatever you want because you know that when you go to checkout and you go through all, you can get roll ons, which you can slip into your pocket. You can get a spray, which is really nice and light and lovely. You can use it as a room spray. You can use it, you can spray it on your hair. You can spray it in your. Uh, you can use it as a perfume and you'll get 20% off. If you do the following, you will enter the promo code happily, H A P P I L Y. I won my third grade spelling bee. You can do that at checkout. And what's even cooler yeah. is that uh, purchases over $35 get free shipping. You're going to get to 35 really easily because you're going to want a bunch of them. I really like that. In fact, the $35 free shipping thing, that's not even involved in the code. No, that's, that's just, just like, even if you forget the code and when you actually receive it in the mail, it's the most delightful packaging. It's, it's You will be so, you'll get tons of little free gifts that uh, can only be described by the word delightful. What I think is great. Though probably you have a better word. Well, just remember that you can save 20% by using the promo code happily mm-hmm. and also you're supporting our show at the same time. Yes. So which thank, we really appreciate. So thank you. And thank you, Frankie and Mer. Yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. I also want to give a small shout out to the Lady Pod Squad. Always. They've been uh, in my earbuds the last couple of days, making things really nice. You know, when you have Frankie and Mir coming and uh, yeah, they're what not going to do. Why they're not here fast enough. I got to no, find some never here elsewhere. fast enough. Yeah. So that might be the thing you do before you make mm-hmm. your Frankie and Mir. Uh... Those are our recommendations for the day. Yay. All right. So uh, next time. What happens next? The next time um, I'm going to. Please don't say another Woody Allen movie. Well, why would I say that? I have like no. <laughs> Just, I don't know. You're the one creating the Woody Allen movie scenarios <laughs> in our podcast. Uh, no. So we were discussing this earlier and I just decided to uh, go with this movie. I believe it's 1996. Jerry Maguire. Wow. That's a classic. Did you just say classic? I did. I don't know why. What, where did that come from? No That's idea. not even a Tom Cruise accent. No, it's not. Okay. It's just a random accent. I don't have that many accents. That's my only one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a classic. Mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to it. It's been a while. I haven't revisited it. We'll Me just have too. to see what happens. Exactly. I 
I remember, you know, the iconic scenes and I remember feeling nice, but I, that may be different next time. How many pounds does a human head weigh? I see. I don't even remember that part. Okay, well, clearly you don't remember the iconic parts then. We're done here. <laughs> Sorry. All right. All right, we'll see you then. Jerry Maguire. See you then. All right. Bye. Bye.